you just did a presentation, can you tell me in a short summarize what was it all about? So I spoke about exponential impact. The idea is how do you positively impact the lives of hundreds of millions, if not billions of people in a very short amount of time, like less than 10 years. I gave a few examples. Uh, the institution that I, came, uh, that I came from and that I graduated in is Singularity University at the NASA Ames Research Park in Silicon Valley and has close relationship with NASA. And yeah, what is that, that Singularity University? I don't understand what it is. So it's, it's called Singularity University, but it's not really about the singularity and it's not really a university, but it's close enough to both. It's about the idea that technological progress advances exponentially and there doesn't seem to be any slowing down effect, it actually is increasing. And it's an extension of Moore's law, uh, the idea that computer speed and performance doubles every 18 months or so, and now even less. And you can see that almost in every field because everything is touched by IT. Genetics, uh, um, sequencing, uh, solar panels, uh, anything that's been touched by IT and almost every sector has been touched by IT now, or by computers in general, artificial intelligence, robotics, automation, is, increasing at an unprecedented rate, exponential rate. And so the idea is how do you leverage these exponentially growing technologies to better the lives of billions of people in less than a decade. I gave two examples. Uh, one topic that I am very passionate about and uh, it's very dear to my heart is the idea that because of the exponential growth of technology and automation, there's gonna be a lot of problems with regards to jobs and the labor market. You wrote a book and it's called Robots will steal your job, but that's okay. How to survive the economic collapse and be happy? So jobs will go away and some, some of them will go away very fast. Some of them already have gone. And uh, I'll just give you a very simple example. Google has now released uh, its first autonomous pods. There are even new, they're not even cars, they're post cars. They don't even have a steering wheel. They don't, they, they, you could face each other. Uh, it's it's, it's self-autonomous driving so robo cars, essentially. They drive themselves, they don't need any human intervention, and they're very efficient. They don't make any mistakes, they don't, they don't have testosterone, so they don't mm -hmm. cut the line. So autonomous cars will be ubiquitous within five to seven years, and they will overtake almost every, everything. And it will change the landscape of the planet, just one piece of technology. Because think about it. Just, just in the US, three million people work for a living doing um, driving of some sort and it's about maybe 120 million people on the planet, if not more. All of those jobs will be gone forever, but at the same time, you restructure the whole of society because you can deliver things or you can be in a different place, live elsewhere, and you don't have to worry about transportation that much. Traffic will be gone. We can get rid of, percent, we can get rid of 90% of all vehicles because people don't need to own a car if they can just hop in any car and then be transported somewhere and they don't have to manage it. So you can get rid of all traffic, no accidents. You will save 145,000 people a year just in the US, I think, and uh, 140,000 accidents. I mean, millions of people every year die because of car, all of that can be gone. But it's a problem because you are taking away jobs. So maybe the problem isn't that jobs are going away. Maybe the problem is that the economic system requires jobs in the first place for people to live. And I think that's the discussion we should be having now. Now your company, Conos. The, uh, and that's educating by video, right? Yes, and we, we figured out a way to essentially have teachers or content creators, educators. We're not talking about traditional schools, we're talking about people who are experts in their field and they have an audience. And we are targeting to start YouTubers that have more than 20,000 subscribers. So they already have an audience and people who want to follow their work and they want to learn from their experience. But there is no way to actually engage in the platform because YouTube is a horrible place to engage in a meaningful conversation. There's no way to track your progress or to know where you are or to have a structured environment for learning. And there is no way for monetizing for the teachers because ads pay very little and they're also very annoying. So we put together all these, all these problems and we actually figured out a way. It could be anything. It could be Chinese culture. It could be how to do plumbing in your house. It could be how to be a professional uh, golf player or how to purify your water in a, a rural place in India uh, with less than one dollar. It could be anything okay. that people are interested in learning and that someone has the skill and the expertise to teach. 
isn't it already so that if I look on YouTube and I want to uh, learn something about plumbing, I will find already something. Mm -hmm. uh, a plumbing guy or somebody who did something. I yeah. mean, what is the business model there? Yeah, so the problem with YouTube is, number one, you can find the individual video, but if you want to learn in a structured environment about that subject, it's impossible because there is no way to learn on YouTube about that subject, to have not just one video, maybe 20 videos, and in between the videos, additional material, to have tests, to have additional things that you can download or you can interact with. That's not possible on YouTube. Also, it's not possible to know which videos you have watched or which modules you have completed or not, because it's not an e-learning platform. So we created an e-learning platform and we're giving away the tools for free. And the YouTubers who are now distributing their content for free, sort of, they are trying to monetize with advertisement. Advertisement pays very little. YouTube takes half of the cut and they give scraps to the creators. We say to the creators, allow people to voluntarily donate to you in exchange for perks, like a 30 minute Skype call with you in a one-on-one -on -one lesson. And you will make way more money than you are doing now on YouTube. You will get rid of annoying ads and you will allow a lot more people to learn from you in an engaged and structured environment. And you get a percentage of that? We just get a percentage of whatever donations they, and it's a small percentage, nothing like YouTube, it's crowdfunding style. Back to my first question about the teachers, you were so excited about the teachers, the mentors, that's real people. Is yeah. video a good way to educate people? Well, it seems to be effective for some, but there is a lack of engagement that MOOCs are experiencing, and we are thinking that we'll be solving that via the study group feature. So when you join a course, you can also join one or more study groups, and study groups are a minimum of two and maximum of four people because that's the magic number where you actually engage with someone and you learn together. And then you self-organize. You can, you can do a chat or you can do a in hangout. That platform, in I mean, you can self-organize. If you, if you prefer Skype, if you prefer Hangout, if you prefer something else, we'll just provide the way for people to meaningfully engage and then they can, they can decide how they want to meet. They might even decide that they want to meet in person if they are close by. And we have an AI system, an algorithm that tries to match people by either geographical location or language or area of interest or level of knowledge so they can have better study groups together. Um, we're in Groningen, uh, students. Um, what do you think of the quality level of education today in general? Well, I don't know Groningen or the... But in general, I would... I mean, think about education. I talk about the difference between learning and education and I try to, talk, to speak about learning as much as possible in, the, in my platform. Learning is something that you do proactively and that you want to do because you want to acquire knowledge and use that knowledge. Education is something that's imposed on you by an authority, whether you like it or not, whether it's interesting or not. And the educational system was built essentially to create colonialism, to keep the colonies mm. stupid. So I don't like education as a word. Okay. Um, sometimes I have to use it because people don't understand when I say online learning, but that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about engagement and learning. And what could uh, like a university do about learning? So I don't know many universities in, the, in details, but I, I know that, for example, Stanford uh, does a lot of work, like teamwork, and they do a lot of projects. Um, I know that Cambridge has also, but th this is secondhand experience, uh, uh, like my sister or my girlfriend or people that I've interacted with. Um, and uh, there are some nice experiments in lower education, in, um, in, uh, in Monte Montessori school, or the, you know, these kinds of new or different kinds of schools. Free. And also uh, a lot of experiments done. There is Ecole 42 in, uh, in France. It's a school with no teachers, no grades, and no infrastructure. And the engineers that come out of there are better than the, than the, than the, than the industry standard. Uh, so it's interesting experiments, and also in Switzerland, sorry, in Sweden, um, apparently there are lots of schools, primary schools, where kids they, they can roam around and learn what they like, and it's very unstructured environment. And so, like the idea is blending learning and flipping the classroom on its head. You study by yourself, and in school you do projects, and I think that's very interesting. You do a lot of things. What do you like most? Our social change. I mean, everything I do is, has, a, has a theme. It's about social change. So my startup, the books I write, uh, the sci-fi uh, novels, uh, 
the films that I, that I do or the videos that I make, the conference, it's all about social change. I just, essentially I do one thing from many different points of view. Your next project, what will it be? Well, I, I finished my first sci-fi novel. Uh, I'm going to publish it very soon, writing my uh, third book, a non-fiction called Society Reloaded. And uh, we'll talk about a lot of things. Uh, I'll talk about exponential uh, impact, but also experiments uh, and things that we can do to solve the issues that I addressed uh, in the first book, among which also unconditional basic income. I'm actually going to run, maybe. Uh, I've been asked by the city of Groningen to help engineer a pilot of basic income here in the Netherlands. So oh, we'll good. see. And about the, the, the science fiction, this novel. Yeah. Why is that? What's well, it about? For, for, for every person that uh, watch, for every person that reads non-fiction, there is 10 or 100 that read science fi or fiction. And for every person that reads, uh, there is 10 to 100 that watch movies. So that's kind of my progression. I started with non-fiction, get academic uh, accreditation, then move to fiction, and then move to movies, and hopefully get the wider audience possible. It's called A Tale of Two Futures. It's about one day in life of two people that live a few decades from now in separate universes, or the same universe, but in two different possible futures. And one of them, uh, things have gone terribly wrong, and the other amazingly well. And so it kind of gives a perspective of the, the futures is not set in stone. It could be either one or anything in between, but that depends on the choices we make now. And so I hope that will kind of inspire people to think proactively about making some good choices. like. We need to revise the patent, copyright, and intellectual property system because that will, I mean, that will be the single thing that will, that will be either directly or indirectly responsible for the suffering and deaths of hundreds of millions of people in the future. Preventing, copyright. yes, yes. Can you explain? Patents, copyright, and in general, the intellectual property spectrum. Preventing people from distributing knowledge, it could be life-saving mm. or drugs or uh, practices, or how to, to build a filtration system, uh, or how to uh, create you know, a hydroponic uh, plant or a diaporotic plant that could feed everyone right. for free, right. or uh, if you have a 3D model of something that could save your life, and that has a patent that you can't use it, and then they track you down, and these things are happening. <laughs> so that, that is one of the biggest issues we have to face. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.